the world's most honored watch is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. Time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, editor of the Freeman and contributing editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Cyrus S. Ching, director of the Federal Mediation Service. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Ching, you are the most famous mediator, the most famous labor mediator in the country, with an experience in that business, I think, going back something like 35 years. And you have been the director of the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service since it was independently established in 1947. I wonder if you could tell us something about how you or your service typically, typically get into a dispute. In reference to your first remark, uh, Mr. Hazlitt, I don't know that's fame or notoriety. Yeah. We, uh, get into labor disputes in uh, several ways. The function of the mediation service is to try to create an atmosphere where the parties can meet with each other and reach agreement. Uh, one of the provisions of the law under which we operate is that the parties shall notify us 60 days before the expiration date of a contract. If at the end of the 30 days, they have not reached a settlement in the negotiations, uh, then we are notified again. That does not mean that we get into all these hundreds of thousands of cases that are up for negotiation, but that is the procedure. Uh, we pretty well know, uh, through the contacts we have with people all over the country, uh, through our uh, agency, we have 220 men uh, in, uh, located in various parts of the country, about what the conditions are in any given area or any uh, given dispute that may arise. About 60% uh, of the uh, cases we go into were uh, invited in by the parties, one or the other, to help them arrive to settlement. The, uh, in some cases, we intervene of our own motion. That would be a case affecting the national interest, affecting the defense effort. Uh, we would uh, step in. Uh, and call the parties together. We do that uh, frequently. But, uh, and have a, have a meeting uh, with them and attempt to work out a solution. But in any case, your services are purely voluntary. There's nothing that you can do to impose terms upon either of the parties. We have no authority, no power to coerce anyone. We can't give, tell anyone what to do. Uh, we may tell them what we believe they should do in their own interest. Well, yeah, but we have no power of compulsion at all. Mr. Ching, to most of our chronoscope audience, sir, I think that uh, our people think of you as being that big uh, man, about six feet seven inches tall, who smokes that big pipe. And it's been your job in the last 10 or 12 years to try to ride herd on people like John L. Lewis and uh, Philip Murray and try to save the country from strikes and from inflations. Now, I'd like to ask you, sir, uh, in your present position and during your long service in Washington, have you been primarily concerned with protecting the American people from inflation, or have you been primarily concerned with improving labor relations between labor and management? I am, uh, was primarily concerned in 1947 when I took this post with the improvement of labor management relations. I was chairman of the Wage Stabilization Board for about seven months. My responsibility there was uh, to attempt to do what we could through wage stabilization to stop inflation. 
The, the big job in Washington today now is is to try to re restrain inflation. Is that, uh, is that true, sir? That is quite true. I think it's the, uh, the job that uh, is concerning most people. And I think one of our great difficulties in this country is that we uh, fail to take into account that you can't stop inflation by merely curbing prices and wages. There are a lot of other things that you must curb also. In other words, there's uh, the question of uh, credit extension and uh, possibly heavier taxes and a lot of other things that might be quite unpalatable to people, but still they're very necessary <coughs> steps to take to curb inflation. Well, Mr. Ching, I'd like to ask you some questions about the present relationship of the Mediation Service to, say, the War Labor Board, the War Stabilization Board, as it is now. Uh, it seems to me there is a curious situation set up when a War Stabilization Board exists to make final settlement. Now, doesn't this create a situation where the parties to the dispute tend to bypass mediation and conciliation because they feel if we got, get to the labor board, let's say a union feels if we can bring this case to the labor board, uh, they'll give us such and such a settlement. And so we're not going to settle for anything less than that and we'll take it to the labor board. Now, isn't that, doesn't that tend to happen at present? They're yes. bypassing the mediation service? Uh, no, I, they, they must. Uh, they must have uh, be able to prove uh, that they've gone through negotiation process and had mediation uh, before they get to the uh, wage stabilization board. It's not as easy to get to the wage stabilization board as a lot of people think. Uh, for instance, uh, there are only two ways you can get there. Uh, one is by a joint submission, where both parties have to agree. Well, obviously, if a union doesn't want to go to the board or a management doesn't want to go to a board, uh, that's out and there's no possibility of having a joint submission. The other way is through a referral by the President of the United States. That takes place only in the case of uh, almost national emergency, something that would uh, have a, a very devastating effect uh, on the nation, on every defense effort, something of that sort. There have only been act nine actual cases referred by the President to the Wage Stabilization Board so far. Well, wouldn't the Steel Union, for example, pretty much know in advance that if they uh, didn't come to a settlement, the thing must be referred to the Wage Stabilization Board? And don't you get a situation then in which there may be just uh, talking for the sake of the record but not meaning to reach an agreement until it gets to the board? Uh, I think that that uh, element is present. Uh, it may have been present in the steel uh, situation. I think it's quite obvious uh, that uh, both sides expected finally to land uh, at the wage stabilization board and the price stabilization board. As a matter of fact, the president of one of the major steel companies made a statement uh, that the case was going to be settled in Washington. He made that statement before negotiations started. Uh, it was quite obvious uh, to those of us who are familiar with the case and the position of the parties that uh, no agreement could be reached between the parties without the intervention of some government agency that would uh, well, have to make some determinations both on price and wages. Well, Mr. Chang, just to put the facts on the table, <coughs> In these disputes now between management and these very powerful concentrations of labor power, such as uh, Mr. Lewis's union or the steel workers, is the conflict between the labor union and management, or is it a larger conflict between the labor union and the government or all the rest of us? Well, what is the role of management there? Management can't... Uh, can't bargain on equal terms any longer with the steel union, can it? Oh, yes, I think they can. Uh, that uh, was said before uh, we had the present laws on the statute books that uh, unions couldn't uh, uh, bargain with management because of their weakness. The management is now saying they can't bargain with unions because of the weakness of management. There's no question that these uh, large labor unions are, are very powerful. Uh, and uh, our whole system of collective bargain, bargaining is uh, predicated on the acceptance of responsibility by both management and labor. And I, and I think that there is ample evidence that labor unions and management both are measuring up to their responsibilities in attempting to make collective bargaining work. But well, where is the strength now, sir? Has the strength, <laughs> has the strength of these labor unions as against management, has that been increasing during the period that you've been in Washington? Certainly numerically. There's no, there's no question about that. Well, isn't the situation that when you get a board like the War Stabilization Board, uh, whose recommendations are not technically mandatory, but pretty close to being mandatory, that it supplants collective bargaining? 
that the government, in effect, then sets the wages and sets the conditions of work. There's no question that the recommendation of any government agency would have a, a compelling uh, effect uh, and have great weight uh, in the settlement of a dispute. I assume that if uh, either side uh, felt sufficiently strongly about it uh, to uh, reject the recommendations of the board, uh, then some other steps would have to be taken because obviously uh, this country couldn't take a long steel strike. Has there been, in your long experience, sir, I, I would like to ask you this. Uh, after your long experience there, and after 12 years of mediation, uh, are you generally hopeful of the future of the country now? I certainly am. I think that this country has uh, faced uh, many times situations much more critical than it is at the present time. Uh, and I, uh, I am uh, optimistic about our future. There is one thing that we have in this country uh, that at the present time I think is one of the most dangerous uh, trends. I don't know that you would call it a trend. And that is the lack of understanding of the American people of the function of the people in their government and the lack of understanding as to how their government operates. Uh, it is well enough for us to indulge in the uh, pastime of abusing our government, criticizing our government uh, at all times for everything, uh, when we're not uh, occupying the position we do today in international affairs. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Chang. I'm afraid our time is up. I want to thank you very much for being with us, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Cyrus S. Ching, Director of the Federal Mediation Service. The timing of the Winter Olympic Games in 1952 is an achievement in which every owner of a Longines watch can be justly proud. The timing equipment, exclusively Longines, was of the greatest accuracy ever used in an international sports event. And most important, the timing of the Olympic Winter Games was in every sense a demonstration of the high quality of Longines manufacturing, because every watch, every piece of timing apparatus was designed and made in the Longines factory by Longines' own technicians and craftsmen. Thus, the Olympic Winter Games is in a very real sense Another honor for Longines, the world's most honored watch. The only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medal awards, and highest honors for accuracy from the leading government observatories of the world. So if you wish to own just about the finest of all watches, your choice might well be Longines, the world's most honored watch. And yet, you may buy and own or buy and give a Longines watch for as little as seventy-one fifty, Longines, the world's most honored watch, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, agency for Longines Whitnor watches. This is the CBS Television Network.